back to Doc's House Calls. Today on the show, we have Guy Roebuck of the soon-to-launch Roebuck Watch Company. Guy's got a new uh, model called the Diviso that will be available, I think Guy told me, in December. Uh, and Guy's also a uh, alumnus of the Microbrand University workshop that we just did this past October uh, leading up to district time in Washington, D.C. So we wanted to have him on the show leading up to his launch. Uh, I think the watch goes on sale in a couple of weeks. So welcome, Guy. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Chris. Thanks for taking the time. All right. So first thing, let's get the obvious out of the way. By your accent, I can tell you're a lifelong native of Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. East Texas. East we speak Texas. a bit different over there. Well, no, you actually do live in Texas. I know you live kind of close yeah. to Austin, but where are you from originally? I was born in New Zealand. New Zealand. What part of New Zealand? Uh, small town, sort of central west coast, North Island. Okay. And what brought you to America? Um, the story starts in England, really. Um, my wife and I are big travellers. And we spent 11 years before we came here in London, sort of travelling about there. And we started doing trips to America and near the end of the 11 years. And we really enjoyed the place. So we figured we need to move here because you know, it's better to live in a country and travel from there. So we entered the green card lottery two times and we managed to get into the draw on the second time. And there's no place more America than Texas. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had a friend who was brought up in Dallas and she had relatives in Austin. So she said, check out Austin. Yeah, good call. here for a week. Dallas, Dallas sucks. <laughs> Austin when we great. came here six Austin. years ago, it was a nice place. No, <laughs> Dallas is okay. I'm from Philadelphia. We don't like Dallas, but I've been oh, there. Okay. Austin's a fantastic town. Yeah. All right. So, and if I'm looking this way, I'm not ignoring you. This is my other monitor over here. So I'm looking at your website, checking out the watches, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, so um, tell us a little bit about, you know, obviously you're starting your company right now. I don't know if you're doing this full-time or part-time. I assume part-time. Tell us a little bit about your backstory. What have you been doing leading up to this? How did you get it into your head that you wanted to start a watch company? You know, kind of your, your origin story, as we call it, uh, on Doc's House Calls. Uh, yeah, so at the moment, I'm filling it in part-time with my full-time job, but with the goal being as soon as possible, full-time in the watch business. So my history is I'm an architectural drafter. I've been doing that quite a long time, since 1995. So kind of, I'd been doing that a long time. Um, I was looking for a change, um, really wasn't getting to use my design skills. As a draftsman, I just sort of work up stuff that an architect has done. So my design skills weren't getting utilized. So I was looking for something to change. It's more like being an illustrator than being a designer, is that right? Um, pretty much, yeah, yeah, and sort of, working on technical stuff, making sure the building's not going to fall down as much as the architecture side can before it goes to an engineer. So yeah, I've been looking for quite a while to do something different. I also wanted to um, diversify, my, diversify my income a bit. So hours for dollars, just it's just for me, wasn't the flat way to go. So I wanted something that was going to leverage that. Why watches? Why not? Some other product, why not shoes? I've um, been looking at lots of different things, but um, as everyone else that's in this business, you know, I love watches, obsessed with time. And in 2014, I found the Watch You Seek website. And that sort of, that was a bundle of fun. And yeah. on that, um, I think it was in the Kickstarter section, people had listed that they'd started um, a microband watch business. And there's a few of them that went through you know, everything really quite detailed. So I guess that was kind of stewing in my head. In 2015, I really felt I have to do something. I need to do something. And yeah, just sort of with what you see pushing on my brain, I felt that watches was the way to go. Right. Yeah, I kind of got, I had a similar experience myself. I was looking for something to do. Um, and when I found Watch You Seek, it definitely, you know, it has a way of sucking you in. It's just so, there's so much, I guess, depth there, you know, mm -hmm. as far as rabbit holes go, that was a pretty deep one. You know, you can spend, I mean, I know, I, I, I didn't, I lost my job, so I had tons of time, but I would yeah. literally 
I would, I would get sucked into something and like six hours later, I'm still looking at it like, a, or a new thread or whatever. And it's like, where did my day go? Where, you know, or I'm up till 4 a.m. Um, yeah, that's it. All right. So, you know, you're, you're an architectural drafter and I can't help but notice that, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of a, a case design geek. When I look at your case design, I can kind of spot some different, different things that you did that are, I guess, structural in nature. Um, that, you know, okay, I, I've seen stuff like that before, but it's something that you don't always get from somebody who has drawn a watch from the front and hasn't spent a lot of effort on, you know, the other, um, what do they call it in architecture, the other elevations. So yeah. you know, tell us about, you know, do, do you feel like there's parallels between watch design and architecture or were you drawing on your experience in architecture when you started working on your watch design? Um, yeah, I think so. My first watch, um, there were elements of architecture in that. Um, I had a sandwich case and I had uh, the 12 and the six cantilevering off the top of that, uh, sorry, the dial, um, the sandwich dial. And they were cantilevering over top of that. So uh, cantilevers on a building. So it was Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water that kind of inspired that. He's got a lot of um, balconies that cantilever. So yeah, architecture, definitely architecture I bring into the watches. So, uh, you were, so that was your, that was actually a design that you did before the Diviso. That you, yeah. So you, you worked on that for whatever reason, you didn't produce it. You tabled it, now you, and now and you came out with the Diviso as sort of your launch watch for your brand. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I was having troubles with the manufacturer, so I cancelled the um, Alpha. And in the meantime, I was waiting for them to get their thing done. I'd been working on the Diviso. I probably worked on that a long time. So I'd, I'd draw some stuff, put it aside, and then come back to it as different ideas came to me. I think for me, that's probably the best way to go. So the other one keep coming back to it and refining. The, the first one was called the Alpha. Alpha, yeah. All right, so tell us about the Diviso, because I've seen it in person, and I feel like the illustrations that I've, I've seen on your website and I've seen you post on social media don't really do the watch justice. That watch has a lot going on that just, it, it's hard to capture it in a, in a two-dimensional image. So. What, what, your, what was your inspiration for the design? What, you know, how do you, as the designer, how do you view it in terms of trying to put it into a category within, you know, sort of a watch lexicon? You know, we, 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 deal, we deal with enthusiasts. They tend to look at things sort of very rigidly, like it's a diving watch, it's a field watch, it's a pilot watch, it's a chronic, you know, it's a racing watch. How do you see it? How, how, or how do you want people to see it? Um, well, I don't think so it fits into the, the sporty line, um, it's not really dressed, even though it's quite polished. So I, I think it's more of a, a sporty watch. Um, yeah, I, I, see I started some the design there. I see some again there. I, I, I feel like it's got like sort of a racing vibe to it. Yeah, there is that too. Yeah, so the carbon fiber and, and then the stripe down the center of it. Yeah, so a bit of bit of automotive. Do Love cars. Inspiration. Say again? Was that your inspiration, automotive? Um, not really. I guess it just kind of turned out that way. I wasn't specifically thinking you know, an automotive watch when I did it. Yeah. The, the dial has this really interesting, uh, I don't know if it's a texture in the dial itself or it's a finish that you, that you figured out how to give it, but it's sort of, I don't want to say it's pinstripe. It almost looks like... Um, almost looks like vents on the dial or like that, like it's corrugated in some way. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it is. It's corrugated. So one day I had got the case down. So I, I knew what I wanted to do for the case, but I had no idea what I was going to do for the dial. And my wife and I are at the local supermarket one day and they had um, the Texas flag painted on corrugated metal. And that sort of sparked off the thought. I thought a corrugated dial would look great. It'd be fun. You know, you've seen it in person, the way the light plays on it. It really does. Yeah. And I think that's part of the reason why the two-dimensional flat format mm. of, you know, your online images 
really doesn't adequately capture what that watch no. looks like in person. No. So the stripe came about, I didn't want to do a full corrugated dial. I felt that would be just too much. So no motor, automotive intent, but I guess with putting the stripe in, having the 12 at the top, that kind of brought in a bit of automotive. But it's not just the, the, the corrugation. I mean, it, you know, there's like shadows there. Is that, I mean, is that literally a shadow of light or is, or is the dial, has, it, has there been color added to the dial to accentuate that pattern? Because it looks like each striation in the dial, it almost looks like there's a shadow which follows it as if there's light going across it. I guess, yeah, so the shadow would be, they didn't do anything to the dial. Um, that would, shadow would just be where the bottom of the corrugation is, the light is sort of over top of that. So the picture I'm looking at on your website, on the product page, I'm looking at the Diviso black and silver. Is that a photograph or is that, a, that's, a, that's a photograph, right? They're all photographs now, yep. The illustrations were there in the beginning, but yeah, I've had the photographs off quite a while now. I mean, you really can't appreciate, you at least have to go over to the photograph and zoom in to really appreciate the dial and the, 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 the carbon fiber weave and that, that um, yeah. vessel surround. I, uh, it's probably a good idea to link a video. I know Brad, the budding watch enthusiast, he did a review just a while ago. Yeah. So I can link that in because, yeah, he, he had it, you know, turning and so you could really pick up the dial. All right, hold on a second. I'm going to look at something here. So, all right, so that it's dark on that side. Okay, this is amazing. So I'm looking at the, the main image. I'm looking at the left side of the dial on the 9 o'clock side. Uh, at each striation, the shadow appears right after it. So it's striation, shadow, light, striation, shadow, light. But then the, the image right underneath it, it's the exact opposite. At that same side, it's striation, light, shadow. So it really is shadow and light playing off the dial. Yeah. It's not colored that way at all. That's no, really no, it's just purely light. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, man, I don't think, you know, what's funny is you've got, um, you, I guess you have two versions of it. You have like almost like panda and reverse panda. You've got white with a black stripe and black with a white stripe. And the white with the black stripe is where you really see that shadow playing off the of that shadow. Yeah, there. yeah, that was a good photo. I picked it up well. Yeah. And then you've got this um, engraving on the case back of a water tower with round rock on it. Is that where you live? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of a, the local landmark of Round Rock. So I thought it'd be quite cool to fly the flag and put it on the back. Yeah, that, that is cool. I yeah. like the blue and orange one too. I, I mean, I like everything about it. I like the handset you chose. I think it's great. I think it really complements the, the, um, the marker style. Um, so any other inspirations for this besides the, uh, the corrugated tin roof uh, at the supermarket you, you saw? <laughs> um, yeah, so the case, what I wanted for the case was, um, excuse me, uh, skeletal lugs and then the top and bottom of the lug wrapping round to the other lug. So it looked like the body of the watch was nestled in, you could say, the bones or you know, um, a steel structure, beams. Right. It almost looks like a girder, like an eye beam. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of an architectural thing there, but the manufacturer couldn't get the lugs down to the thinness I wanted. So I went with the next best thing, and that was just recessed the whole thing. Right. And so give that effect. So on the, on the four o'clock crown, you've got your R logo for Robot, but on the two o'clock crown, you've got TZ. What does that stand for? Uh, timing zone. Okay. Yeah. So you can use it for a countdown or time elapsed. Got it. Got it. Cool. So I guess it's actually, I guess that would be a count up timer, but still you could use it. You could use it for, it's like, like a diving bezel. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you can go either way. So you and set it before 12 o'clock for, you know, a tough specific time or 12 o'clock to the um, minute hand. And then you've got time elapsed. And the standard strap option is this um, stitched leather strap. Yeah. Yeah, just the one strap I've offered on there. All right, so then tell us, I know you're waiting on, all right, so you you didn't do Kickstarter, you didn't do pre-orders, you financed all the production yeah. stuff. For better or for worse. <laughs> I mean, that's that's really unusual for 
a lot of startups like us where it is yeah. just one guy and a dream. Most of us will, we don't have the money in many cases, or we're just trying to minimize our risk or, or you know, manage our risk. We do pre-orders, we do Kickstarter. You went completely the other way. You just said, screw it. I'm going to roll the bones here. Yeah. So the, um, the alpha last year, I tried Kickstarter, but I canceled it and it was clear it wasn't going to fund. So with this one, I decided I'm going to take some equity out of my house and just fund it myself. My wife is having kittens, but it was, for me, it was the only way I could do it. Well, you know, I, um, you know, obviously I understand the risks involved and, you know, I understand the, you know, the pressure you certainly must feel, hmm. but at the same time, you know, and, and you may have seen this as well. If you go on watch, you seek, or if you go on Facebook, I think there's this rising tide of, in, of sentiment among many enthusiasts where it's like, I'm tired of Kickstarter. I'm tired of pre-orders. I have money now. I want to buy the watch now. I want to get it now. And I'm tired. And, and some guys are kind of not just tired of pre-orders and Kickstarter, but they're almost like, I don't like the idea that you're asking me to help you fund the startup of your business. I would respect mm -hmm. you more if you just, if you want to take a chance on starting a business, you're going to reap all the rewards. Okay, fine. Take a risk. Don't, you know, don't make me be your bank. So hopefully yeah. you get some guys who appreciate the fact that you did take that risk. You do believe in yourself and your product and your design that strongly that you did not go the pre-order or the Kickstarter route. Yeah. Yeah. I just, that's the way I felt. You know, if someone wants to watch, you know, for me, the idea of waiting three or four months, which could turn into five months or six months, you know, your money's gone and you're waiting. I want it now. Right. It's just the instant gratification generation. But yeah, so that was one push for it as well. It's just, you know, people buy a watch and it's, you know, they've got it in a few days or overseas a couple of weeks at most. All right. So they're in production right now and you're near the end of production. They're going to, they're going to be here very soon, right? Uh, yep. I just received an email today. QC is set for this weekend. So okay. however long it takes to go through customs, that's going to probably be the longest thing. So I think I'm still on, on a schedule for early December, first week of December, maybe. So, and you're not going to take any money from anybody until you can actually ship the watches. Nope. So you're not on anybody else's timeline. You could, you could have these things ready to go first or second week of December and you don't owe anybody an apology. That's it. Yep. That's great. Yep. All right. So this is the week before Thanksgiving. So by the time this video airs, you could be delivering watches the following week. So it could be next month. As, as people are watching us talk, we could be looking at your watches are available for sale next week. It should be. Yeah. I'm hoping so. Yeah. Well, next week or the week after is it sounds like that's the timeline. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. So you were at district time in Washington, DC. You had the watches on display. Did you get a good sense for, you know, the reaction from people, how they felt about it? And how was the feedback? Um, yeah, yeah. Feedback was great. Pretty much everyone that came past loved it. Right. Yeah. So which is really people? encouraging. Did you feel like people knew you from seeing your watches on the forums or on Facebook, or was it a complete surprise to them? Um, there were a few that had seen Instagram and Facebook posts, but probably most people, they'd never seen it before. Yeah. Right. Well, that's cool. So, but yeah, I was glad to do that event, you know, get it out there so people can actually see it in the flesh. Right. There's so, buying things online is a bit hit and miss, especially watches. You know, companies, they do wonderful photography, photoshopping. And when you get the watch, it's not the same as what you looked at online. So I wanted to get it out there for people to see, even though it's a limited market, they could see it. Yeah. No, I mean, would see it. We, um, so we kind of, I, 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 I always tried early on. I always tried to get good photography of all the watches and I never, felt like the photography really did the product justice. And I worked with some really great photographers I and mean, they were professionals. Um, yeah. And, you know, I would sit there all day with them in some cases, like going through, you know, okay, can you take this little, you know, glare out or you take this reflection out or whatever. And it tends to like sort of deaden the image, you know, kind of mutes. Everything that makes the watch come alive in person gets kind of muted and flattened 
when you do that in Photoshop over and over again, but you're trying to make the product look right and, you know, and, and have an image that looks professional. And we just got to the point where I'm like, this is stupid. Like we're spending all this money on photography and people go, meh, doesn't look that great. And then somebody actually buys the watch. Like this looks amazing. You know? <laughs> all right, you know, we're just going to do 3d imagery imagery now. And we'll supplement that with real world photos that are not professional. And those often are the best images. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah some of the images you've had are absolutely amazing. You know, close enough to real. Yeah. So that's, that's something I'm going to pursue down the line for sure. I think. I mean, I photography think is difficult and expensive. It's really expensive to have to hire a professional photographer to take your pictures. If you're not good enough to do it yourself and I'm not good enough to take my own. Nope. <laughs> um, and it, it really is such a disappointing result in so many cases, even if you're working with a fantastic photographer. And I worked with two guys, one guy in particular, he actually specialized in watch photography. And another guy was a longtime product photographer with a, you know amazing setup. It was never a lack of, budget or a lack of time or effort it was always just you know I, I guess maybe it was a lack of budget i mean the, the big companies they'll do some things that you know you really couldn't afford to do like they'll take 12 different images at different exposure depths and compress those into one so that uh, every yeah. single surface or every single plane of that image has exactly the same crispness i mean you can't do that as a small brand you just don't have the budget no I mean, just the budget that's isn't there. Yeah. Um, it's difficult. So let, let's talk a little bit more about the Diviso. Just kind of give some basics about it, and then we'll move on. Um, so it's 42 millimeter diameter, just under 50 millimeter log to log. So, you know, pretty sort of standard proportions. Um, yep. Under 12 millimeters thick. So, you know, pretty thin watch, should wear pretty nicely on the wrist. Um, 10 ATM water resistance. Sapphire crystal, anti-reflective coating, uh, rotating inner bezel for you know use as a timer, applied markers, super luminova, Miota movement, Miota ninety thirty nine, uh, no date. Does it come with a date option or are they all no dates? No, no date. I didn't want to mess up the dial with a date. Yeah. All right, I support you there. Um, <laughs> monogram crowns and guards. So your your logo and TZ engraved in the other crown and carbon fiber bezel insert, uh, an Italian leather band. So, you know, calfskin leather band. So, you know, all around, really nice watch, retail price, 600 bucks. So, yeah. you know, fairly yeah. priced, ready for delivery, no pre-order, no Argo Bargo, no, no waiting, no delays, just order it now, get it now, starting either next That's week it. or the following week. Good to go, yeah, yeah. You have, how many different versions of it? There is four. Four versions, so there's a white with a black stripe, black with a white stripe, blue with an orange stripe, kind of a golf racing colors, and a uh, really nice sort of, you know, gray with, uh, I guess, like a British racing green. Yeah, well, it's British racing green. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that's, and then they all have that red triangle on the bezel. Really nice. So what are you working on next? Um, so the next one, I've taken the original Alpha and really redesigned it heavily. Um, from feedback I got on that, but also things that I weren't happy with. Um, the thickness was the big thing um, that everyone was a little bit off on. Um, my original design, it was so thick because I wanted a double V stripe running around the watch. But the manufacturer said they couldn't do that. A double what stripe? A double V. So an intended um, V but two of them stacked on top of one another down the, the sides case. of the case. On the case? Yeah. So around the side of the case? Yeah, yeah. so case. just recessed Vs. Okay. Yeah, that's something different. Um, they couldn't do it because meeting at the corners you know, could be very difficult. Right. And it had taken a while to get to the drawing stage. So I said, okay, take it out and run with it. I should have stopped right there and redesigned it. And brought it down so I've completely redesigned the case it's still um, cushion case um, the original dial was sandwich it's still sandwich but I'm doing a textured lower dial rather than rings so yeah quite heavily revised so that's in sample process now I should be getting that within the next two or three weeks the samples oh great yeah 
And then I've just started drawing up a diver. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you got a lot on the table for next year. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping I can have both of those out for sale by near the end of next year. Great. All right, so, you know, you're, you're getting ready to launch your brand. Um, what are some of the challenges you've had to this point, other than, you know, the, the factory couldn't make the watch the way you wanted it, or maybe that's the biggest challenge. It, has it been? Um, yeah, that was a, a challenge. Sorry, do you mean can't make the Deviso lugs how I wanted them? No, I just mean, you know. Just in general. Yeah, just in general, like, you know, um, one of the, sort of, on this show, a lot of times I'll ask people, you know, like, why watches, what's your origin story, but also, you know, I hear a lot of stories from different brand owners about, well, you know, I, I, I started out thinking this, that proved to be a bit risky or challenging or a struggle and I changed my strategy or whatever. You know, what are some of the things you've had to sort of overcome? Some of the challenges or, you know, from your perspective, what have been, you know, sort of the yeah. major hurdles you've had to get over just to get here? Yeah, so really the biggest one, and I guess a lot of people are running for this, is finding a good manufacturer. Right. So that's been the biggest thing. So for the Deviso, I found a good manufacturer. But then the second hurdle is time. And it's still taken a long time to get from, you know, my finished drawings to finished product. Um, from, you know, reading posts on what you seek in there, it seems that's you know, the way things go. It's never as fast as you want it to be. No. So I think really those two things, good manufacturer, and um, yeah, just being willing to go through the time. Probably another thing is everything else that goes with a business. And you sit down thinking, yeah, I'm gonna design watches, so you start drawing pretty pictures, and you get to a point you need a website, you need to set up a company. Taxes, there's, there's so much more that you need to learn on the business side to go with it. So that's been a challenge as well, trying to work all of that out. Yeah. I mean, you know, production takes, they'll tell you three months. I mean, hopefully they tell you three months and not two months, but really by the time you get through production delays, shipping, quality control, it's four months in most cases. And if you get stuck with your production going past Chinese New Year, it's five months. And if you have a major <laughs> delay, it's six months. I mean, you can, yeah. quickly, you can very quickly get from three months to six months. And that's after you've gone through the wait for prototyping. Prototyping can take three to four months. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, again, you know, how long did you work on the design for it? I mean, if you're doing this part-time, you know, did you take a week, a month, two months to work on the design? I mean, sometimes things take a while to, to work on that design. And then you find out after you've been working on something, the factory comes back and says, we can't do it that way. And you go, well, I wish yeah. I had that leading into this. I, there are certain things that we can draw. And the factory says, well, you know, you've got these two lines coming to this point. And our, you know, machining doesn't have the tolerance, you know, small enough to be able to do that in that, at that surface, at that point, you can't do that. Like it doesn't work. Yeah. I'm like, well, there are certain people don't understand. Like there are certain things we can draw that we simply cannot make out yeah. of the materials using the machines available to us. Yeah. And you're so right. Was... The, 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 the stuff about running a business, we all think it's going to be nothing but sitting there at your desk drawing pretty watches. And <laughs> yeah. That's 5% of my time. Yeah, it is a very small part, really. But anyway, yeah, it's the best part. I enjoy that designing. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. What about, you know, social media? I mean, I, I know, I, I see over and over again, you know, it's sort of the same story play out where a guy comes to the Facebook group or to the forums and goes, I'm thinking about making this watch. And people go, that is terrible. Kill yourself. I mean, <laughs> your reaction sometimes is so negative. Have, have you struggled with that? Um, the first, first watch, um, I just did uh, AutoCAD render and put it on watch you seek. And I think there was one comment. There's lots of looks, but you know, not one comment. So I don't know if people need a 3D render to be able to get it, but yeah. It was a terrible thing, terrible, terrible. But um, to be fair, the alpha, I didn't put anything on what you seek or on Facebook. I just sort of drew it and sent it off to a manufacturer. Um, in hindsight, things you learn down the line, you know, get feedback. Yeah, 
for yeah. sure. Especially, it was a pretty controversial case, so I should have got feedback from it. Well, I mean, that's something that maybe it's a good segue because we talk about that in like a grand university. We talk about yeah. the product development process and the importance of getting feedback and doing a bit of field testing before you reach the point where you have to commit to prototyping, much less full production. So yeah. you know that that was, you know, sort of a, an eye-opening, you know, experience for you going through that the first time. Hmm. And then we reinforced that in Michael Brand University. So, you know, let's yeah. it there. You just went through our course uh, in October. Were there things in the course that, you know, were kind of a bit of a smack in the face or having been through one and a half or so iterations of design to production, did it all kind of mesh for you? And you go, okay, I, I, I kind of already understood this, but it, this is a, a good way of kind of reinforcing it. To, it from your perspective, was it, a lot of, was it more surprise or more kind of just reinforcing what you were, were already learning? Um, no, it's more reinforcing, yeah. So I've gone through you know, those bits and pieces that were challenges. So yeah, you guys sort of went through those sorts of things and how to deal with those sorts of things. So yeah, it, it wasn't sort of anything that was a shock, it was just sort of better information and helping me going forward, especially making better decisions and faster decisions and getting things, you know, running properly. So yeah, no, it was a great course to do for sure. Well mm -hmm. worth the money. Well, we, we hope people, you know, get a lot out of it and they, you know, they feel like it was worth it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that one of the things I learned before we started Michael Brand University, I learned from John, you know, tour, the other, the other John in um, our course, our, co our group of coaches is how much, time I was losing in the production process because we didn't spend enough time up front during the design part. So we were doing all this work in design and then we would go to try to get it prototyped or try to get it produced and we figured out well even though we spent all that time we kind of we skipped steps or there were things we could have communicated and nailed down prior to starting production and now we're in production and we're finding out or we're in prototyping we're finding out the design's been changed and we have to argue about that back and forth with our vendor for a month or we're in production and we're finding out that something we built in the design isn't going to make it out of the back end it's not going to be yeah. deliverable so the importance of having a good really you know nailed down formalized product development process that includes getting all of that stuff ironed out for sure up front before you start production or before you start prototyping even is just it saves you so much time on the back end yeah for sure I and mean, that was you know great to learn there's you know, nothing i knew about and i certainly hadn't done it with the first two watches so i think yeah that's going to be very beneficial yeah everyone there is just their experience was fantastic to have access to them it's great yeah but in the meantime they can go to roebuck watchco.com and sign up for your email newsletter and i'm sure you're going to be sending out an email to everybody to let them know oh for sure yeah. yeah yeah as it gets closer i'll send out a couple of emails you know, so people know exactly when you can jump on it all yeah. right anything you want to add before we uh, wrap this up uh no that's no, been great appreciate all right. it all right guys so thanks for taking the time everybody go to roebuck r-o-e-b-u-c-k watchco.com sign up for gary's email newsletter Follow him on Instagram. We'll put the URLs for Instagram and Facebook page uh, underneath the video. And uh, Gary, or Guy, sorry. Best of luck <laughs> in your launch. Thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate it. Right. Take care. Yep. See ya.